Hello. Welcome to the Malibu Music Room. I'm John Zampetti. You know, I put together this series because I wanted to expose you to some of the amazing talented musicians that are coming out of Malibu right now. I feel very much like Malibu is what Liverpool was in the early 60s. Bands are developing here, each with their own unique voice, and then breaking on the national and sometimes even international level. I've been in a unique position because our son Johnny is one of those musicians. And since we have a large music room, his friends tend to come over here to rehearse or maybe just jam after a show. Malibu is in a unique moment in time right now musically, and I wanted to archive it as well as expose it to those of you who don't know what's happening right in your own backyard. So come on in, sit down, and welcome to the Malibu Music Room. I wonder who that could be. Why, it's Cisco! Why, Come on, Mr. Betty! Welcome to the Malibu Music Room. Happy to be here. Come on. Cisco, welcome to the Malibu Music Room, bro. Thank you, very Honored, honored to yeah, be right. here. Thank you. I'm it. honored. I've actually, I've really been wanting to have you on here for a long time. I love that. I didn't even know. Because to me, you're kind of the, the Gazari, the Godfather. That's amazing. Of <laughs> is that good? That's a good thing. It right? is a good thing. Okay, good. You're, you're the Godfather, kind of of, of the resurgence of Malibu music. I love that. Um, I mean, you know, the, one of the reasons, I mean, the reason really we're having the show is because there just seems to be a whole resurgence or a, a uh, eruption of young Malibu musicians and talent. I love, and, uh, I love that you're recognizing that. You know, and I kind of, you know, at the time really also equated the Malibu win almost to like the cavern in Liverpool. Oh, it was special, man. It was really special. I'm glad it's back, even in its whatever state it's in right now. Yeah. It's still always going to be the Malibu Inn. The right. sign is still up. Right. As long as there's a great act in there, I think people will come and have a great time, right? Yeah. So call it what you want to call it. But the thing is, it really is like a kind of a breeding ground, whatever you want to call it, where because, it, because people can play original music there. Yeah. That was the thing about yeah, the Malibu Wind. You know, where yeah. everybody, else, every place else, everywhere, almost in the country, you have to pay to play. And it's hard for bands to really develop new material. Yeah, every community, every music community that has, has, uh, that is known of had a center or a sort of nucleus that was a venue. Yeah. You know? um, and people don't usually think of Malibu as a music community, strangely. Yeah. Even though it's like every musician and their yeah. mother, literally. But they really there. don't think of it as a new music. It's like a place. Well, maybe get, that's what it is. People is a place people come to you get after successful, they've made it. You come here. Yeah. It's like Florida for old uh, yeah. rock stars, yeah, right? Right, right, right. right. Um, but no, really, that's just sort of like. You know, that just means when you're walking around, you're walking amongst a lot of legends and hopefully it inspires yeah. these young kids. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, you've really been kind of at the root of all the, 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 the formative bands of Malibu. I mean, starting with, um, where you kind of came in on Backbone, you know I mean? Yeah, yeah. Did wild. you know Chris Williams? Or yeah, of course. Yeah, of yeah. course. Knew Chris well. Um, and my, you know, White Star originally was uh, me and Asher. And then Backbone backed us, literally, right. when okay. we would play live. Okay. So at that point, we were, you know, I was a sort of a hip hop producer that found my way to rock. And, and I started making these records that were sounding sort of more rock, you know, influenced. And, uh, and then met, obviously those guys were my, you know, best friends at the yeah. time. So we were just like, let's play live. And it sort of turned into this, it was wild. And, and how it ended up with, you know, Chris, obviously horribly passing away yeah. and us just fusing into this new band yeah right so it's like the band itself had like malibu generations in it well yeah because we had Dwayne betts and uh, orby yeah i mean we had names in that band that we could never outshine <laughs> well i mean was that was like a double-edged sword i guess for you yeah it too. always was now looking back it's only fond and it's like you know yeah. i can see how pe how it was tough but yeah um but to me, it's just, you know, it, it was just dudes. It's unfortunate that it had to be taken that way. Yeah, because the music really wasn't Roy Orbison music or all no. of this music, you know, you know. And a, kid's, a kid of someone is never going to play the same exact music. They're going to most likely rebel. Well, not only that, I mean, Orby's a drummer. That's Roy true, was a that's true. You put, you, yeah, because yeah. he probably was hanging around the sessions and, took, yeah. and was watching the drummer for some reason. Right. You know? Yeah. 
So, yeah, it's funny. It's it's always been a topic of discussion with that band, which, yeah. you know, that's what that band was and should always be. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, with White Star, I mean, I was, I mean, I saw a lot of White Star shows, obviously, yes. and, um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, not blowing smoke, but I really, and I th I've told this to you before, I thought you were one of the best live frontmen I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, and I've gone to a lot of concerts. You heard it I'm, here. I'm an old man. Gentlemen, I take that as well, because, a compliment because you have seen a lot. Because, you know, to me, you all, you had the kind of the, the Roger Daltrey energy, but you also had the acrobatics, <laughs> which, I mean, <laughs> I, I still I, can't get over. I mean, I was there the night in the Malibu when, when you broke your foot. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's crazy. I think about that now, and it's crazy. I could still probably do a good backflip off I some mean, drums. Forby was in the drum set, I'll do a backflip off of one. But did you do something off the rafters, or what did you do? I was do? all sort of, I was all over, you know what it was? It was like, for that time on stage, I was there to entertain and go, and whether it, you know, hurt me or maimed me or right. sent me to another, like, transcendental state. Yeah. I don't know, I just go. Well, that's, t that, that to me is what the essence of the front man is. That's why I'm saying that, because it's like someone who... Doesn't I mean, he's like, gives it all. Gives it all. Yeah, we're up there. We're the ringleader. It's leader. like you care so much you don't care. Yeah, you know that you're just ready to roll with whatever. It's funny because I, I think I was always a front man that needed a band, even yeah. in like kindergarten. Do you know what I mean? I was, right, I was right. searching for that energy. It's funny, and then when you find it, or or maybe not front man, but entertainer, when you find it on stage, and you're like, oh god, this is what it. This is what it was. Yeah. This was the joke in high school that I made that made people laugh and made me feel good. This is like, you know, it's like this weird selfish desire, but also selfless yeah. at the same time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. you care so much you don't care. Yeah, it's wild. You know, and, um, but White Star really got to a point where it was a really cohesive band. I mean, you, it was like, again, yeah. these things sound crazy whenever you do comparisons, but you kind of have to, to put a perspective for people who haven't heard it before. It was kind of the next Rolling Stones. I love it was that. A, it was a combination of the Rolling Stones and the Who. It's wild. We were, the, we were the biggest band that never made it. Yeah. I always say that. Yeah. You know, and it's funny. We were a band for seven or eight years in different incarnations. We had horns one time. We right. had, you know, but by Tony the, Potato. Tony Potato through the whole time. Yeah. But <laughs> that was one thing that was like, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick the wrong things to talk about, we're gonna give you something really wrong to talk about. Right. You know, but the band by the end, we really did figure it out, and we figured out our influences, and yeah. we figured out how to process them. And I think for me, as a producer now, that whole process of figuring out that in interesting, weird project over its course mm -hmm. sort of led me to to know how what I do now. I think you know. Yeah, and and like I say, you guys really had it down in terms of live performance. But you were also one of the first people, I think, that in terms of my recognition, that re that recognized the changing business model of the music business, and realized you had totally. to start you had to start selling it on television, online too. Online, yeah. I mean, we were one of the first bands on MySpace, YouTube. I look at my YouTube account, and it's it's from back then, right? And it was like the dawn of it, and um, it's funny because every project I've done. I consider them all one big project yeah. of me, right? My whole life, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine them not all being there in exactly the same way they've been. Right. And, and one morphed into the other, which then like, you know, this became that, that became this. It's yeah. so wild. It's yeah. really fluid to me. But tell me a little bit about, I mean, the, the impact of television. I mean... Somehow Huge. you recognize that and got White Star with the VH1 show, The yeah. Rock Life. Yeah. And, I mean, that became a whole nother it's hilarious. venue it's hilarious. for music, vehicle for, for people hearing your music. Yeah, you know, it's funny because people, had, because of the names in the band, people had always thrown the reality show thing around, right? It yeah. was also the dawn of the reality show. Right. Especially around here, where, right. where a lot of the big ones came from. Yeah. Um, so they threw that at us. And we were just very careful, but you could not deny that this band we felt was great, and we want, and we also felt we were like a cast of funny characters. Mm -hmm. If people can see this, yeah. maybe it'll break the bands. That show was interesting, and I don't think I think White Star was meant to do exactly what it did, right? And it's mm -hmm. like beautiful in that. But then learning from that reality show experience, 
when we did the one with Shwayze, yeah, we knew what not to do. Yeah, we had the music and the album to back it up and set it up, and it and it really was a massive game changer. Yeah, in one night. Yeah, in one. No, I remember night. hearing about that with Shwayze. Yeah, where you guys were on Warp Tour. Yeah, and one day you're on whatever stage six, yeah. and the next day you're on stage with Katy Perry. It was at stage one, and like running from kids. It was. Yeah. it was instant. TV's still super powerful. It's going to change in its own way. We'll see how that. But I think the medium of television is just like I mean, it's huge. It was crazy. Yeah, but I mean, you had the vision to actually see that and to get that, and not only to see it, but to execute it. That's the thing about trying to execute it. I mean, yeah. lots of people have ideas. Yes. But executing is a whole other level. There's doers and there's don'ts. You yeah. Know what I mean, I just like to like do it. I saw I saw an opportunity. Well, it's amazing you could get VH1 to do that. Yeah, twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After the first one was so interesting. Yeah, you know, I think... Uh, but then even that you took to the next level. Yeah, because you know, talking with Johnny, he was like the the you're not only doing the warp tour, go to the state, but then suddenly you also did, figured out how to monetize that by DJing. Yes. After the shows, you get yes. picked up and go somewhere. To I DJ. was definitely early on that DJ tip that's, too. Exactly. Man. That's so funny. But, but you what know what made you think? That seems like such an. I mean, again, I'm coming from a place you know where I was playing in the '60s. Yeah. And '70s. Yeah. And um, we could still sell records. Yeah. But. He, you know, we would never think about like after a show. We, yeah. Of course, we would want to go to a club, yeah. but we'd never think of having the chutzpah of telling somebody, you know, whatever, <laughs> give me ten grand and I'll come, or whatever the number is. <laughs> you know I'll what? Come, it was a combination. I'll come and pick you up in a limo. It was an I'll, accident. I'll, I didn't sit you. there in a room and devise this <laughs> weirdness. Like it was definitely like I saw the walls crumbling. I saw opportunities. I saw that. Um, I think I just always liked to. Again, it was another way to make people move and and uh for for the Swayze project we would have him come in and do two songs during my dj set and it was a way to take that music and get it in the clubs mm -hmm. you know what i mean so everything was this like trojan horse like for the next thing yeah you know uh but yeah as musicians now you got to be a marketing department you got to be a, a complete you know 24-hour entrepreneur and yeah. identify different revenue yeah well, right. that's what's so different about you, really, is that is being you're not only a producer and writer, musician, but also you're an entrepreneur, too. And yeah. that is a very rare combination, because most musicians want to have someone else to do everything. Yeah, it's... And they'll gladly give a percentage of it away, but then there's no control over what's going on. It's and, changing, and there are the new breed are <clears throat> extremely entrepreneurial. Yeah. And these young kids that came up in this... You know what I mean? They're even better at it. Yeah. They are amazing marketing machines. They are, they're figuring out how to sell limited edition t-shirts to a small handful of people. Right. right. At some point I looked at it and I said, we have this many people, but why concentrate all the time on this many people that you don't have? Figure out how to like activate the people you do have and get them, you know, on board because they're the ones who are going to take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. It's not you. You can like shout as much as you want, but until someone yeah. says, "This is great. I like this. You should listen to this or you should check this out." That's when it translates. But getting back to the <clears throat> to the Swayze Warp Tour DJ thing. I mean, where did you get that idea from? Because I mean, you literally one day you're on stage Tommy Lee. Of... Tommy Lee was the first one. Really? Tommy Lee's a homie and he was doing DJ gigs, and it was sort of, he was probably one of the first celebrity DJs, um, celebrity DJs that was like right. known for something else, but now found themselves in the DJ world, yeah. right? Uh, and so his agent was a friend and said, let me try to book you some DJ gigs. I think we can do the same thing. You know, there was all sorts of weird going on right. as well, so... Um, and it started to work. And it's funny, when, we, when the Shwayze project started to pop off, you know, we had all the big agencies who wanted to book us, but we ended up staying with this small boutique agency that right. had booked me in the DJ world and in the clubs and was really dialed into the clubs and colleges. And I think it really helped us permeate, uh, you know, those sort of like entry points. But you were able to pull it off right away while you're still on the Warp Tour. Yeah. That, that to me is like, how did you... We just, I was just that there would be actual interest in someone 
wanting you in the club. You know what? There was also other, there were ulterior motives of those bookers and people and the reasons they want you in the club, right? Right, right, right. And it's like, if you're you're larger than life and your lifestyle is what you're selling, this is why I usually only work with lifestyle acts, then people are going to want to come and hang out and that's, and be a part of the lifestyle, right? So that's what I know. Mm -hmm. Like, go with what you know and I know the how to throw a party, right? White Star started before White Star I was a club promoter, <laughs> and I had a list of all these like ton, hundreds of girls and hundreds of like party going dudes who like to go out and spend money where the girls were, and we had this list because we were throwing clubs, you know. And then when it came to, when White Star was sort of happening, the first show I just promoted it like a club as yeah. the place to be. Right? So right there, there was a difference in like promoting even how the band was promoted. It was like, you have to be there. Mm-hmm. Like that's where dudes want to go. The girls want to go to see the band. The dudes want to go to see the girls. Mm-hmm. It's pretty simple. I don't know. It's all mathematics. Well, but <laughs> so it's, 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 again, it's, 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 it's getting people to want to be part of your fabulous lifestyle. Yes. I mean, that's, yes. you know, that's, it's bringing the reality show. Yes. And part, part of me of feels like I'm just blessed. And I live this weird, wild life. And mm-hmm. I also just want everyone to be able to live it with me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's not just me wanting to try to commoditize it. And it's more like I think that uh, a lot of people might want to come on this like train and have some fun. Yeah. You know? Well, the next step, of course, was Swayze. Yes. And I remember you, <clears throat> because again, you know, you really were like the th- first 360 guy. I mean, you were doing everything. You were producing the band, basically... Oh. Booking the band. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, make, yeah, I didn't you know, book it. I didn't book mm. it, but no, it was more, it was definitely a hybrid. But you were making sure situation. everything worked. You were really yeah. managing it. Maybe you were booking. Yeah, there was you were like kind a, of like really managing the day to day. Yeah. To make yeah. sure everybody, you know, got I paid mean, and everything happened, to, you know. Just, uh, <clears throat> that's just what I do, right? Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't spoken of. It was just. Right, I but made, you had kind of 360 control over the whole thing that was going on. Because I remember at one point you telling me, that your, fa- this is a story. Remember, I may not have it correct. Yeah. But your father had said to you something about Cheech and Chong was the greatest thing I ever did. Two guys in a suitcase. Yes. Oh, I did. I did know that, and we did. We did like sort of subscribe to that, which was two guys in a microphone. Yeah. So right. that's what I'm saying. The transition yeah. from White Star to Swayze was the two guys in a suitcase. Man, except it was, it was a laptop, not a suitcase. Well, it was from nine dudes, right? Figuring out how to get nine dudes to a gig that no one wanted to see. Mm-hmm. Or taking two dudes to a gig where there, it's packed with thousands of people already ready to right. have a party and ready to, to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And and when it was came down to me going, there was a point where it was like, do I do this or do I do this? It was just straight. One is easy. Mm-hmm. And one is pushing a rock up a hill. Right. And I felt like White Star was, we were playing old school music. We were playing music that the Rolling Stones had done better. Right. Is what I felt at one point. Mm-hmm. Nick never did a uh, fact flip though. That's true. But, if, <laughs> but I wanted to make music that in like 30 years, kids are like, that was my Rolling Stones. Yeah. And well, I didn't feel like I could do that playing that old music. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I feel like with Swayze, we hit a cultural sort of, we hit something with those kids who are still, it's still the part of their soundtrack of their yeah. youth, you know? It well, you pretty quickly, you know, like I said, went to stage one, but not only that, you went to number one on uh, iTunes. It was crazy. We had a top, it was crazy. It was wild. And it was all, I'll tell you what, the one thing I know is that the, the music led the way there and the kids grabbed it and ran with it, right? And we followed. So like, when a song is a hit song, you will know because it'll take off. So tell me a little bit about your producing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, obviously, the ones I know anywhere like Mickey Avalon and Wiz Khalifa. When I produce, I tend to end up with lifestyle acts, or at least, you know, I've had the fortune to all, to like create my label and only produce acts I want to yeah. produce for the most part. Then I take something every now and then. Obviously, there's a lot of huge acts I'd love to produce for, and when they come along, I jump at the chance. Right, right? Um, but. Yeah, it's a lot of lifestyle. Anything on Banana Beat, the label, is lifestyle-based, and it, you have to feel the fabric of it, yeah. and it has to be more than music. It has to be the connection. Yeah. You know? But, I mean, that big breakthrough, I mean, with having the uh, songs in, in a Hangover, I mean... Uh, yeah, that know. was... Fu- like, all that stuff is, like, little step, 
little yeah. step, little step, you know, and each one's bigger and each one's bigger. And then sometimes uh, every now and then you look back, and you're like, damn, I kind of made a lot of music. Like, yeah. oh, damn, some people listen to that, yeah. right? But I look at those videos with Kid Russell and even Wiz. It's, it's Malibu. It's like it's so cars funny. and girls and... It's Jan and Dean. Yeah, I mean, listen, <laughs> people come to me for for what they come to me for. Yeah. You know, and I, no matter what I do, I think it it sounds like me. Yeah. Which I, I, I don't, I hope. Well, that's the whole yeah. key, of course. Yeah. But I mean, someone like me who's really not versed in hip hop or, yeah. or, or, or you can find rap, your way in through me. I can find my way <laughs> in because to me, I always think of it as being so, the topics being so dark. Yes. Normally. Yeah. You know. Well, that's changed a lot, yeah. and there's a whole new movement of positive rap. Yeah. And I think that goes with the times. Yeah. Right. When kids are sad and angsty and things are tight, that's the music that it's yeah. going to be. Yeah. Right now, everyone wants that freedom. It's sort yeah. of a new uh, hate Ashbury hippie vibe going on. Yeah. You know, and it's the cycle. Speaking of that, because I always think about it, with lifestyle, you were kind of a fashion. Magnet as well. Really? I mean, okay. Well, I mean, you you brought in, you know you brought back first in in my little time I've known you I've brought back the uh, the the head scar neckerchief that came back amazing. first. It's and then, amazing. I wish you had stock in fedoras. I mean, I you, mean were, you know what? There are the a first, lot of people wearing hats. Now. You were the first fedora guy. I, you know, I well, maybe it's go the, on record. Okay. Because you, I was, I'm not going to say it, but he could say it. I can say it because I mean, I was I remember the transition from the the pirate. <laughs> Neckerchief to the fedora, and then it followed after. So there been some bold statements. I just like I don't know, man. <laughs> Again, like I think I approach everything the same. Like a little from here, a little from here, yeah. a little from here. Yeah. Right. There's obviously people who've done it before me. You also are unusual, Cisco, and you're really an entrepreneur too, getting involved in other businesses. I mean, obviously you're doing writing and music and production, and you're an artist as well. But you're getting involved in other things. Tell me about some of the other companies you're involved with and things you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm a partner in uh, a great brand called Siki Eyewear out of Malibu as well with John Hildebrand. Um, and we approached the brand from the beginning as a lifestyle movement and almost like a band. Yeah. Um, and then I just did the, uh, I just did this Cody Simpson record that I'm really proud of. Um, and he was a, a young pop star. Um, that we now sort of at 18 figured out his sound and presented him to the world as you know What he really is which is a, a ridiculously talented guitar player and singer. Let's go check out one of Cody Simpson's new videos now you a flower if you're like I know I'll never be the stars up in your sky but I'll pick you a flower if you like she loves me she loves me not she says she loves me has she forgotten that she loves me love me one more time I'll never be the apple of your eye I could pick you a flower If you're like Girls. I'll meet you down by the end of the road Where the sunset glows and the garden grows I got one pair of shoes with 20 holes in the toes And I would walk 20 miles just to get to those blue a smile for me to my surprise I was there for a while to see what comes next Or we could take off our clothes and have Long conversations in French uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know I'll never be the apple of your eye But I'll pick you a flower Stars up in your sky, oh no, but I'll pick you a flower if you're like. And she loves me, does she love me? 
loves me not, she says she loves me Has she forgotten that she loves me? Love me one more time I know I'll never be the apple of your eye But I'll pick you a flower If you like Violets are blue, but it is true I'll be too if I don't have you So I just chill up on the hill Picking daffodils, making wishes About you, misses Cause I know I'll never be the apple of your eye But I'll pick you a flower The players on it are Cody Dickinson from North Mississippi All-Stars, drummer, who's ridiculous, mm -hmm. plays on all my records. Um, uh, Kari Mateen, who's you know, in sort of the Roots campus base. Uh, Donovan Frankenrider, G-Love, all on the record. Oh, Donovan, of course, yeah. Donovan's the best. So, you know, Cody was a kid who was a pop kid who w did really well as a pop kid, but was signed at 13, and at 18 finally realized that wasn't the music he wanted to make. So he somehow found his way up to my perch. <laughs> and your lair. And the first night... That man's did, lair. Yeah, we made, it, we made this song Flower the first night, and it was like, hey, man, this is cool. We should just make a record. And we just took off and made a record for the next six months. And uh, it's, it's on Banana Beat, my label, and then his imprint, which now he will uh, carry on as well. And mm -hmm. I try to empower yeah. all these kids and artists to, like, you know, look at this long term and make careers out of this and become entrepreneurial in their sort of adventure yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm doing that and I'm a dad I'm a dad man that's well, the best I mean, ever let's talk about a little bit best of, production ever because at one point you were like the most eligible knucklehead you know it's amazing uh, <laughs> for a long I time I don't even remember and it's just funny because I mean I knew you at that time and it was like it was like Mr. TMZ is like, uh, oh, cameras everywhere the guy goes. You can't eat in cookies because this guy's going to be here with a camera it's thing amazing. or whatever. I'm so glad that's over. Yeah, and then Barbara and Ace, it just, it's just, it just, it seemed to happen so quickly and so. I just found, yeah. Clear. I mean, I just found love and and it hit me over the head. Yeah, and that was it. It's funny. You look at the the like old school stories of rock and roll and all that. They never end well if they keep going that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I'm very fortunate. I'm lucky. I don't know how or why she she decided that, you know, but she knew and and I followed suit. So. Amazing. Cisco, I'm so happy you came down. Thanks so much, man. Like I said, we wanted you here for a long time. It was great. You I are the godfather. I mean, all these bands kind of, well, I mean, you you, you sowed the seeds for all these Thank you, groups that have come out of here. I mean, just going down the line, you know, Backbone, White Star, Swayze, I mean, even now, Dwayne's in Dawes. I mean, it's like all... Isn't that the, amazing? Yeah. It's just, and Dwayne played on the Cody record. Yeah. And I've remained friends with all these amazing people. And we just had the Brethren on the show here, our last show. Dwayne is ridiculous, and I think he's finding himself after years of He really of, is. Of it's just, it. he really opened up... We get a chance to see that show. He really opened up on that, about Chris, and about himself in general. He really yeah. opened up, and uh, he's a very deep guy and a great guitar player. But all these things that you're kind of involved in this, and this, and it keeps on growing. All these bands are yeah, man, happening now. Iron Tom, all these people are, it's wild. are coming, and hopefully the Malibuins coming back a little bit. Feels like it is. That. Yeah. That's a good sign. So it'll be great. All right, man. Thank My you. Thanks a lot, man, for coming down. Thank I really you very appreciate it. I appreciate it. See you back again. Yes. On the Malibu you. Music Room. Yeah.